I've been tearing apart every spec sheet and hands-on note I can find because what gets me excited is the engineering, not the marketing. Right now, the industry is split between bold evolutions at SHOT Show 2026 and a wave of non-powder systems trending on Amazon, and I want to show you exactly why the guts of these things matter. I'll walk you through how a 4.18-inch match barrel changes accuracy, why a 5,000 PSI PCP tank forces different sealing and safety choices, and what a serialized stainless steel chassis actually does for modularity, all in plain talk from the inside out. I'm calling out the real trade-offs I care about, reliability, maintainability, and ergonomics, not hype. If you want me to tear down one of these on camera, hit subscribe and tell me which model you won't strip down first. I'll do the tear down for the most requested. I want to start with something that screams engineering-minded practicality, the M&P FPC in .22LR. On paper, this is a platform exercise. Take a folding pistol caliber carbine, shrink the recoil and ammo cost with rim fire, and keep all the ergonomic bits that made the center fire models useful. What matters to me mechanically is the decision to keep the folding mechanism that allows the optics to stay mounted while the gun collapses. That's a small engineering win for portability without sacrificing zero. The rifle keeps a 16.25-inch threaded barrel, so you still get decent sight radius and the option for a suppressor, but sheds roughly one pound versus the 9mm variant, which changes handling and felt recoil dynamics. The fact that shares magazines with the M&P 22X 20 round and ships with spare mags is more than convenient. It's logistics, same feed geometry, same magazine catch timing, fewer proprietary parts to manage. Materials and rail layout, Picatinny on top, M-Lock on sides, show they built it to be modular and field serviceable. For training and range work, .22LR in this platform is brilliant. Cheaper rounds, similar ergonomics, but expect softer extraction and slightly different barrel harmonics compared to centerfire. Trade-off, lower terminal performance, but massive gains in training economy and everyday shootability. Now flip to the opposite design priority, squeezing accuracy and capacity into a microframe. The CR920XL's headline spec, the 4.18-inch match-grade barrel, tells the story. Longer tube, longer sight radius, and a barrel made and tuned for consistent harmonics. That match-grade barrel combined with an extended slide changes the pistol's balance and gives real ballistic and aiming benefits, more muzzle velocity, and a more precise sight picture. What's clever is how they preserved micro-compact ergonomics while offering a 15 plus 1 flush fit magazine. Mechanically, that requires tight feed lip geometry and confident magazine spring rates so rounds present cleanly in a narrow stack. Finish and materials matter here. Offering both black nitride and bronze TICN coatings isn't just cosmetic. TICN has different surface hardness and friction characteristics that can affect slide wear and reliability under dust and grit. The longer slide and barrel makes slightly harder concealment, but the trade is a pistol that shoots like a longer-barreled gun while still tucking into many G43X holsters. From a gunsmith's perspective, the key vulnerabilities to watch are timing with a longer slide and magazine reliability in tight tolerances. Both things shadow systems appear to have engineered around, but they're the exact bits I'd inspect first on a teardown. I love modular engineering, and these two pistols show why a well-designed chassis and integrated compensator matter in the real world. With the SIG P320 mod, the headline is the serialized stainless steel chassis and the lightweight polymer grip module. That split lets manufacturers tune balance and recoil characteristics independently of legality. Mechanically, a serialized internal chassis becomes the datum for lockup and trigger geometry, so changes to grip modules won't ruin your point of impact. The P320 mod's low-profile flat trigger and pro-cut slide for optics lower the bore axis and improve sight acquisition, but the real win is in the consistent trigger over multiple module swaps. Over at the Echelon 4.0C Comp, the discrete single-port integral compensator is the engineering highlight. Because the comp is part of the barrel-slash-assembly, gas routing and timing are controlled precisely, less muzzle rise without adding a threaded muzzle or bulky add-on. That design also lets Springfield place the front sight behind the comp to preserve a clean sight picture. 
From a construction point of view, pay attention to how gas ports are chamfered and how the slide cuts affect rigidity. Poor port geometry or improper slide stiffness can upset barrel harmonics. Bottom line, these guns trade slightly increased manufacturing complexity for meaningful gains in follow-up speed and modular adaptability, exactly the kind of engineering I geek out on. Mechanisms are where I live, and the Sabre ARV's roller-delayed buffer system is a textbook example of alternative recoil mitigation doing real work. Unlike straightforward blowback PCCs, a roller delayed arrangement mechanically delays bolt opening via rollers that disengage under controlled geometry, spreading impulse over time and reducing perceived recoil. That changes not just shooter comfort, but also the stresses on the receiver and bolt face. You can run lighter recoil springs and get crisper resets, which is why training rounds feel more controllable. On the hardware side, PSA's Sabre build uses a billet 7075T6 lower, machine rail, and a nitride chrome molly barrel, all choices aimed at durability under high round counts. The lower's geometry to accept ARV9 and CZ Scorpion mags requires tight tolerances at the magwell and bolt catch interface. Any slop there ruins feed consistency. The Sabre two-stage DLC trigger, paired with JP reduced power springs, shows how trigger systems and buffer spring rates must be tuned together. Change one without the other and you get timing issues or bolt hold open failures. From a teardown perspective, I'd be checking roller surfaces for wear patterns and ensuring the buffer geometry hasn't been modified. Those are the small mechanical truths that determine whether a cleverly engineered system stays reliable after thousands of rounds. I love seeing old mechanical solutions adapted for modern cartridges, and the 940 Reboot is a perfect example. Converting a snub frame wheel gun to 9mm forces a design decision at the cylinder. Rimless cartridges don't grab the extractor edge, so you ship the concept of moon clips back into play. Mechanically, that shapes the entire extraction ejection approach. Moon clips keep cartridges aligned and allow simultaneous ejection, which is elegant but adds a dependency, clip availability, and correct tolerance. On the internals, keeping a double action only internal hammer and a fully stainless frame simplifies corrosion resistance and long term timing stability. Stainless barrels and cylinders are more forgiving in storage and high round environments. From an ergonomic standpoint, a 2.17 inch barrel on a small frame tightens sight radius and increases perceived recoil impulse. The engineering answer is in the grip geometry and mass distribution. The 940's VZ grips and tritium front sight are not cosmetics. They shift purchase and sight acquisition to counteract the snub's inherent trade-offs. The real teardown detail I'd eyeball first is cylinder timing and the moon clip fit. Tiny tolerance mismatches there ruin reliability. This is classic gunsmithing. Convert a cartridge and you suddenly have to reconcile extraction physics with human ergonomics. When you look at big bore PCP stuff like the AEA Harpoon, you're reading a manual about pressure engineering, not ballistics marketing. A 5,000 PSI fill spec isn't just a headline. It dictates regulator choice, valve sizing, O-ring compound, and even the decision to twin cartridge the pistol for two-shot capability. Those high pressures require carefully selected seal materials, often PTFE blends or high-grade nitrile or urethane, to survive repeated fills without extrusion or blow-by. Barrel design for slugs also matters. You want a bore profile that stabilizes heavy projectiles without leading, and you have to balance porting versus smooth bore performance depending on slug type. Thermal and shock management is another design axis. Repeated high energy shots heat the valve and can change regulator output. A poorly regulated system will show velocity drop off quickly. In the Harpoon's case, twin independent cartridges create redundancy but add complexity in fill procedure and plumbing. From a mechanical viewpoint, check the foster valve interfaces, safety reliefs, and how easily the operator can inspect seals. Those are the maintenance realities that determine whether a cool gadget becomes a dependable tool. Switching lanes to electromagnetic acceleration with the CA9 coil gun is fascinating because the engineering constraints are entirely different. Battery energy density, coil timing, and projectile magnetic permeability properties dominate design decisions. 
where firearms and PCPs deal with combustion or compressed gas, coil guns must manage pulse shaping, the timing and sequencing of coil energization so the projectile accelerates efficiently without getting attracted prematurely to downstream coils. That requires a microcontroller that can handle high current switching with precise microsecond timing and a robust powertrain high-discharge LiPo packs, and MOSFET IGBT arrays. Thermal dissipation is a core structural concern. Coils heat fast, insulation degrades, and thermal cycling warps formers. So material choice for coil formers, potting compounds, and housing ventilation is engineering critical. Projectile geometry and mass are tuned to the magnetic circuit, wrong mass, and you either waste energy or fail to accelerate properly. For reliability, attention to connector robustness, EMI shielding, and safety interlocks, so you can't fire with the housing off, are the mechanical details I care about. This is less about barrel harmonics and more about electrical and mechanical co-design, and that crossover is what makes it so compelling to me. 8. FN303, Umarex T4E HDX, and Sabre Pepper Launcher, Less lethal hardware is its own engineering world. Projectiles are fragile or fluid, magazines are often drums or tubular feeds, and propulsion can be pneumatic or CO2-driven. The FN303's semi-auto air system and 15-round drum meant engineers had to prioritize repeated reliable cycling with soft projectiles that deform on feed. That typically pushes designers to gentler feed ramps, larger clearances at the chamber mouth, and magazine geometry that supports variable projectile shapes. Conversely, the T4E HDX uses tubular magazines and CO2 quick pierce adapters. The challenge there is ensuring gas pierce reliability over months in standby and preventing slow leaks that ruin velocity consistency. Sabre's pepper launcher leans into ergonomics and recoilless propulsion. Without recoil, sighting and follow-up are human factors problems, so grip shape, fiber optic sight placement, and an effective grip safety are major parts of the design brief. From a maintenance and standpoint, look at chamber sealing, projectile containment during transit, and how easy it is to clear a jam without risking accidental discharge. These systems trade lethality for repeatable delivery. Engineering them well is a balance of feed geometry, pressure consistency, and user-safe interfaces. Mechanical energy weapons like the Lancet F1 torsion crossbow challenge assumptions about compact power delivery. Micro-limb or torsion limb designs compress energy differently than classical limbs, often offering a shorter overall profile for a given power level. The torsion approach alters limb stress distribution. Designers must model fatigue cycles and choose composite layups that resist micro-cracking. Limb anchoring and limb to riser interfaces were fatigue hotspots. Proper bedding and preload geometry determine repeatable performance. The Fenris 5 Aero magazine is a small revolution in feeding a traditionally single-shot system. Magazine alignment, aero retention, and release tining must all be tuned so the aero doesn't kink or rub on the rail during cycling. Tolerances are tighter than you'd think, because arrows are long and any misalignment ruins ballistic consistency. From a maintenance and reliability perspective, watch magazine feed powels, retention springs, and how debris ingress is handled. Dirt and grit are the enemy of any high-rate mechanical system. These designs show that even primitive energy storage systems benefit from modern materials and magazine engineering. Training platforms like the RXP-22 prove a pattern I see across modern design. Mimic centerfire ergonomics cheaply so shooters can practice more. Threads, RMR cuts, and weighted magazines are deliberate. They reproduce recoil impulse timing, sight picture, and reload ergonomics, even if the ballistics differ. Material choices, AIS 1440 barrels for durability, 7075 frames for stiffness, are cost-optimized to deliver the right tactile feedback and longevity for training use. From a design perspective, the trick is preserving key interface points, magwell dimensions, sight height, and grip angle, while allowing cost-saving substitutions elsewhere. Stepping back, the broader technical patterns are clear. Modularity, serialized chassis plus grip modules, integrated recoil management, integral comps and roller delayed systems, exotic propulsion, PCP, coil, and high-capacity packaging in small forms, 15-plus flush mags. Each trend introduces trade-offs. Manufacturing complexity and tolerances go up, qualification and QA costs rise, and maintainability can suffer if designs lean too heavily on tight tolerances. The market reaction will sort winners. Law enforcement may pick platforms that reduce recoil and training time, hobbyists will chase high-tech novelties, and trainers will embrace rimfire clones for economy. For me, the most exciting designs are those that balance clever mechanical solutions with maintainability, because engineering that's impossible to service is just a prototype, not a tool. All right, here's the short version. Design choices are the story now. Whether it's a 4.18-inch match barrel that rings extra accuracy out of a microframe, a serialized stainless chassis that makes modular swapping predictable, or a 5,000 PSI PCP system that forces you to think like a pressure engineer, those guts are what actually change how we use these tools.
I care about the bits you don't see in the promo photos, timing, seal materials, magazine geometry, and how a compensator or roller delayed system reshapes recoil impulse. If you like the deep dive, tell me which model you want me to tear down on camera. I'll pick the most requested and do a full mechanical teardown step by step. Drop your pick in the comments, smash the like button if you want more nerdy breakdowns, and hit subscribe so you don't miss the teardown video. Thanks for watching. I'll keep hunting for the engineering that actually matters. See you in the next one, and as always, hold them down.